Welcome back. In this episode, we're going to talk about co-productions. The term co-production is thrown around all the time, right? And I think the point of this episode, more than anything, is to unpack what's a co-production? What does that term mean? And what we're going to walk, walk through in this episode is, in our view, the three types of co-production. First, you have non-treaty co-productions, which are co-productions between two producers, potentially in two different countries or states, that are not done pursuant to a treaty. The second type is a treaty co-production. It's a co-production done between two producers in two different states pursuant to the terms of a treaty signed by those two countries. And the third type of co-production is called a co-venture. So to launch things off here, why don't we start off talking about non-treaty co-productions? Sam, well, do you want to jump in? Thank you, John. Um, a co-production, like you mentioned, is whenever you have two parties that basically participate in producing a film. In other words, you know, they, pr they co-produce the film. And um, the main reason you'd want to have that type of structure is because filmmaking these days is not limited to any one area. And uh, the story is often told in many areas. In fact, some of these high budget films like the Bond movies and other stuff, you probably can have a 10 <laughs> locations and you can have 10 types of co-production partners. And the other types of co-productions which we've seen, which are non-treaty, is you bring on a partner, okay? Sometimes European partners want to be co-producers because the broadcaster is supposed to participate with the production company in producing it to trigger some of their funds. So those types of co-producers are essentially financial types of uh, uh, production, co-productions, where they don't come into the creative side. Now, remember we, just, we, we were just going over the service production uh, tax credit, right? In a co-production, you can actually bring in different jurisdictions, and each one of them, as we're going to see, may have different rules for service type tax credits. So you could have a non-treaty co-production between Hungary and Canada, or a Canadian producer and a Hungary producer, and none of them are looking to follow the treaty, follow the content rules of any one of these jurisdictions, but just simply say, hey, we shot part of the film here, or we shot part of the film here, we, co we, we post-produced it over there, it's a co-production. And we'll just get credits based on where we spent money. Co-production. Right. So is there any, in terms of non-treaty co-productions, what else is there to talk about here? Well, I mean, the co-production itself is set up as it, it isn't the structure, okay? It isn't that you incorporate one company and both of you own it. A co-production is essentially a contract. You, you enter into a co-production agreement with your partner. And in that co-production agreement, it's a marriage. And that marriage basically has to cover an enormous amount of, you know, items that are necessarily needed if you wanted to cover every single aspect of your relationship. You're dealing with contingencies. Yeah. If this, then that. Yeah. If this and this and this, yeah. then that. Yeah. What happens if there's an overspend? What happens if there's an underspend? And the list just How goes on and on and on. Yeah. I think. How do you bring in the money? The simplest kind of co-production agreement is probably two pages, right? If it's non-treaty. It has to be. I've never seen one, though. Yeah. Well, right? The, 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 the shortest co-production agreement that we did was six pages. And that was with these Chinese co-producers because the Chinese co-producer had stated that I won't read past the six page. They basically told our client, which and our co-production agreements are like 20 pages plus, okay, that we will not read past page six. So it's like in high school when they give you a word limit for an essay well, assignment. The, 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 yeah. the <laughs> issue with co-production, if you try to... To, to, gut, to see how you need to do every aspect of it. In other words, remember, you're financing and you're producing a film together, okay? And you're post-producing it and then you're distributing it. So 
all of the elements that need to go into a co-production agreement. A, you have the intent of the parties and what their roles are. You have to split that budget, okay? And who's doing what? How do you make decisions? And if there's a problem and a conflict on making a decision, who overrules, okay? How does the money actually flow? The setting up of the bank accounts and who signs on the bank account and if anyone's ever been on a set while you're producing, okay, and you have hundreds of people working and you can't have a five-day approval clause on a decision to stop your production because your co-producer needs to approve something, you've got to have the ability, if you're going to do something efficiently, to have something that basically is done immediately, okay, and you can't stop that production itself, then you have to say to yourself, well, okay, now how do you split the profits? And, and what happens if there's a loss? What happens if there's an over budget? So if you had to try and put all of that in a contract, it'd be a hundred page contract, okay? So the most com important component of the co-production is your partner. Choosing that co-producing partner and, and, that, and having the trust with that co-production partner. If you have that, you don't even need the contract in a way, right? Because if you, in a way, you're basically, if you view the film together, you have discussed it together and basically run it, okay? You may not need a real production agreement. The only problem is what happens if something goes wrong? So that's why one of the most complex agreements that we actually encounter are the negotiation of co-production agreements where the parties try to put in as much as possible what happens if something is going wrong. Here's the one extra kicker that I would add. As tightly drafted as these non-treaty co-production agreements are, they are regulated solely by the intent or the goals of the parties. What you don't have is some supplative law or treaty in the background saying, by the way, in addition to your agreement, your co-production agreement satisfying the desires of these two parties, you also need to satisfy our treaty requirements. Mm -hmm. You don't have that. In that sense, non-treaty co-pros are a little bit more like the Wild West. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about treaty co-productions mm -hmm. right now, right? And this is where Canada really stands out. Mm -hmm. Treaty or co-production treaties are effectively treaties signed between two different countries, right? So for example, you could have Canada, UK, mm -hmm. Canada, Israel, but you could also have the UK and another country, right? It's not, there's no hub where Canada plays a central role. Mm -hmm. Where Canada stands out is that last time I checked, Canada has signed more co-production treaties than yeah, any wanna, other country go in the there? world. We'll, we'll can go there right That's now. That's it. Yeah. So if you pull up Telefilm's website over here, this is a list of every country with whom Canada has a co-production treaty. All the way from Algeria, Argentina, Australia, Belgium, Bosnia, down to Germany, Greece, Hong Kong, Iceland, Israel, Italy. Italy, by the way, was one of the first co-production treaties that Canada signed. Yet, I'm told that very few official Italy-Canada co-productions occur. If you look at it, I think you get a lot of French, France, Canada, uh, co-productions. In France, we have two treaties. One is for cinema, one is for television. And you get a lot of United Kingdom co-productions. Uh, but like I said, it's all the way from Algeria to Venezuela. Okay. One missing country in here is the United States. Exactly. And we'll get to that, how we can maybe partner with the United States. It isn't necessarily... Canada refusing to sign with the United States. It's more the United States that refuses to enter into bilateral treaties. The U.S., yeah. last time I checked, has not signed a single bilateral treaty. Mm. Right. So, uh, so it was the U.S. that decided maybe we, we probably we would have been able to sign a, uh, a treaty itself. In fact, at one point, I was sitting with the Louisiana Film Commission, and I told them, I said, because we were Quebec, right? We said... Louisiana is part of the old Nouvelle, Nouvelle France, France, right? New France. So I said, why don't we sign a treaty between Quebec and Louisiana? And the two state, the state of Louisiana would uh, recognize that they could co-produce with a Quebec and Quebec would recognize that they could produce with Louisiana. 
itself. And it never got off the ground, but there was a lot of interest coming from that. And Quebec itself has actually signed with Morocco, um, their own uh, provincial, or they call it a state type, state to state treaty. So if you look at what are the requirements of these treaties itself, um, maybe we can talk about it. The general guidelines for co-productions is that you have to meet what is called their requirements, which is that everybody who participates in that film, okay, is supposed to come from either, let's call it Canada and the UK, Canada and France, from one of these two countries itself. And in a way that creates a little bit of an issue because not everybody that you can put on a set or on a film will necessarily have those, you know, nationalities. The interesting component when you're dealing with Europe is that a European nationality, you could be doing a Polish film, a Polish co-production, um, and I think Poland has a co-production treaty with Canada, okay? But Poland could mean anybody in, in Europe, and you'd be Polish. So all of the European treaties here, okay, can be crossed because by themselves, so that you cross-pollinate, and a national is a European national. And um, so it, it essentially that broadens enormously the, amount, the ability of getting your participants. The next element is the fact that the producers who produce, so if you're a uh, Poli Poland-Canada co-production, treaty co-production, those producers must be a Polish producer and it must be a Canadian producer and their nationality must be from those. So they have to control the production. Um, the production itself has to share copyright. Most of the treaties require that the ownership of the film is co-owned by both parties, okay? And that both parties have a, a minimum contribution. So in other words, you can't have a co-production where there's 2% Poland and 98% Canada or Right, vice versa. It's almost uniformly, at least when I've looked in the Canadian co-pro agreements, it's almost uniformly 20% minimum, right? 2080 is the, is yeah. the usual uh, amount. Although we're saying 2080, I do think one thing should be added, although we don't need to go into tremendous depth, is you can have a bipartite co-pro. You could also have a tripartite mm -hmm. co-production, which is, for example, Canada, France, UK, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in that case, each one has to hit at least 20% yeah. of a minimum financial contribution. Mo most of the um, uh, treaties allow what you call a tripartite co-production, so that you could actually have three countries. And under the European Convention, you can have also, um, a, which has, a, a, it's another treaty within Europe that allows European producers to co-produce with each other, and they can bring in a third country, like Canada. What agreement is that? It's the, the European EU Convention, Convention yeah. Yeah. On, cin on film. Yeah. So essentially, you can have a European film where Canada comes in, not under the Canadian treaty, but under what is called the third country participation. So it, it, it creates uh, like um, situations where there was a film called The Red Violin in Canada, which was basically a, I think, uh, five country co-production. That was the history of the violin. Yeah, right? the red, vi the red who, violin, nineteen ninety-eight. Passed through, um, and it's Francois Girard who was the director. Um, if you look at the country part of it, country Canada, Italy, USA. They wrote UK and Austria, and it was done in French, English, Mandarin, Italian, and German, which they 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 actually had different languages being spoken throughout that film. So here's a, an interesting example of a five-part type co-production. Uh, USA probably being just a third country where they, uh, they probably went and do some of the filming on that. Um, so in terms of the um, co-production uh, treaty, are there, another element is the distribution. Um, all of the films have to have a distribution within the territories of, that you're co-producing, similar to what we said shown in Canada earlier. And um, what 
they tend to do is that the co-production partner from, let's say, France would keep the French territory. The Canadian partner keeps the Canadian territory. And they often share only the non-co-production country territories. And that share is usually in accordance with their percentage participation. So in other words, if we take a 20%, 80% contribution, 20%, 80% copyright ownership, they would probably have 20%, 80% distribution net profits participation on that side. So that aspect, see, like we just mentioned, the treaty requires all this, right? So what the treaty has actually done is it set forth that framework of the co-production agreement. Exactly. So you need to comply with that treaty yeah. because one of the things that is important to underscore here is that when you are applying for certification, I'll, I'll actually backtrack for a second. If you want to do a treaty co-production, it needs to be certified as a treaty co-production by entities in each of the two countries. So in Canada, that entity is Telefilm. Mm -hmm. In the UK, I believe it's the British Film Commission. Uh, correct? I, I, I can't remember what the name was. It wasn't creative. Uh, it, it, there is a, a film commission in the UK, that the certification agency. That certifies it. Yeah. So each each entity needs to certify uh, this production as a treaty co-production. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they'll ask to see in your application is a co-production agreement, mm -hmm. right? Which, apart from regulating the relationship between the parties and it being a necessity from that standpoint, it's, an, it's a necessity by virtue of the fact that if you want to get certified the certifying authorities want to see that agreement. Mm. Um, so moving down, right? We're talking about participation of third countries. We mentioned mm -hmm. that, right? You can actually bring in a third country and there isn't any set rule on it, but you could go to a third country even to go and shoot there if the script requires it. In other words, you're not completely set that the film must occur only in your two countries. So, for instance, if the script is Hawaii, right, and you have UK, Canada, well, you could go to Hawaii to film it because you obviously won't be able to find Hawaii in Canada or the UK itself. So you can get that third country coming in to participate in that manner itself. The problem that it creates, and we've seen this in many situations, is that those country participations can't be significant because otherwise you won't be certified and so forth. But is it, uh, is it really just limited to like a location shoot, for example? Like, or can you shoot, let's say, a sequence, an eighth of a movie mm -hmm. in New York? You know, this is the... Well, they, they, the rule of Telefilm was that it was 30% in third country. The European Convention says 30% can be done outside the, the two participating countries. But it isn't a set guideline. In other words, it could be it could be thirty three, uh, and it isn't in the a, a, the actual treaties themselves. Right. So, like, while there's no bright line rule and mm -hmm. there's there's just a guideline, it's probably pretty clear. For example, though, that you can't if you're doing a Canada UK copro, you probably can't shoot like a, a formulaic New mm -hmm. York rom com where it takes place ninety percent mm -hmm. in the UK. Mm -hmm. And maybe, some, uh, sorry, 90% in New York, in New York yeah. and maybe they fly to the, the UK for a long weekend yeah. in the rom-com. But what you can do is shoot a rom-com that takes place in London and one of the two people in the rom-com has like a job interview yeah. in New York and that's a sequence and that's... An American in Paris or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. So like, again, like many things in tax credits and copros, not a lot of bright line rules, right? Yeah. Or a fair amount of bright line rules, but also a little bit of a little bit of play. But well, one of them is that the script writer cannot be a third country participant. The same thing with the director; they won't accept um, significant creative contributions coming from outside these countries. And the, we've seen a lot of problems in structuring deals because of that. Because the moment that you have a script that originates anywhere in the world and somehow you, your production company or your producer takes that script and maybe gets a rewrite 
done by an American screenwriter, all of a sudden that script and story and film may not qualify for, a, for any type of treaty co-production. It does create issues in many ways where the co-production structure almost is more restrictive than the content structure that we talked about earlier. And obviously less, you know, it will be more restrictive than any type of service production. So it's literally, again, another aspect of why when you're creating your film, you're developing your film and so forth, you really need to sort of have a vision of where it's going and how it's going to be financed and produced and possibly be speaking to as many people as possible who are aware of these rules, okay? And not necessarily do something and then later on find out that because I did this, now all of a sudden I've closed these doors on being able to do something in, in these countries. Right. So treaty copros, you have these requirements which you need to hit, which are set out in the treaties themselves, mm -hmm. right? And to the extent they're not set out in the treaties, you can... It, the treaties govern first, and then the will of the parties govern second. So to the extent that there isn't something in the treaty which says you can't do this, the parties can determine yeah. between themselves how they treat Other XYZ. than some guidelines that are being exactly. you know, published by the different certification agencies. So you have these requirements. Next is certification, and I touched a bit on that, right? You need to be certain. If you're going to be a treaty co-production, let's say Canada, UK, Canada, France, you need to have the entities of each country certify the co-production as meeting those requirements. So in Canada, that's your application to mm -hmm. telefilm. But why don't we talk about what's in your bag of goodies, right? That you get out of being a certified treaty co-production. Obviously you've pooled resources from two countries. Mm -hmm. You've shared legwork. You get locations in both countries. But what do you get other than that, right? Well. In Canada, it's, re it's recognized as a Canadian film. Exactly. So, and you'll get the content credit, which is a higher percentage credit, okay, without having to meet those points requirements and that production spend in Canada, okay? So, you, A, you have a higher tax credit. B, because it's a Canadian film under Canadian uh, broadcasting rules, okay, Canadian television broadcasters will pay more for a Canadian film, in Europe, it would be called a European film, and you'd be potentially able to get funding from agencies like Yurimage, and therefore there are other soft monies that ends up getting uh, triggered. Um, in France, for instance, there is um, this similar types of quotas for a French film. If that French film meets a certain number of points, it is, it is recognized as a national film, getting greater support from either, you know, broadcasters over there or financing institutions over there. So that's really why you do want to follow these treaty aspects because you're getting more money for it. Essentially, you should be getting more money for exactly. it. Exactly. And that's a nice spot to jump into co-ventures, right? Mm -hmm. Because in, co in a co-venture, for example, you have a Canada-US co-venture. You don't get a Canadian content film for the purposes of getting Canadian content tax credits. What you do have though, is a Canadian content film for the purposes of the CRTC, the Canada Radio and Television Commission. So co-ventures, let's take a step. That is essentially a co-production. That's not a treaty, okay? That was, we take an expression that was given by the Broadcasting Act or uh, regulations, which says they, they labeled it a co-venture. How you're able to do a co-venture means that you now are not subject to these limitations on the treaty, but you can actually co-venture with a U.S. company. Right. And so, like I was saying, you are Canadian content for the purposes of the CRTC. I think one important point to hit on is, well, okay, that's, that's great, but what do I get from that, right? You don't get tax credits, but... The way that Canadian broadcasting works is if you're a Canadian broadcaster, that means that you actually have a little spot on spectrum, right? Spectrum mm -hmm. is scarce, which means that the CRTC requires Canadian broadcasters to broadcast a certain amount of Canadian, Canadian. content, mm -hmm. which is 
a Canadian content quota, let's say. Mm -hmm. the, re the result of that or the consequence of that is that Canadian content is scarce and these Canadian broadcasters need it to hit their quotas to keep their licenses, right? So that justifies a premium in the marketplace for Canadian content. So if your picture is a Canadian US co-venture, it's Canadian content for the purposes of the CRTC, that means that you could command a higher license fee for the Canadian sale or what we often talk about as being a premium, mm -hmm. right? So that could That's be- That's significant, especially in you know smaller budget type pictures where that money can be very, it make the difference between the being financed or not. And, but, but the, it opens up that possibility of having U.S. collaboration. It, that is really where that co-venture opportunity exists. Now, all of a sudden, without having a treaty, okay, you can take films that are, could be done partly in Canada, partly also in the United States, share that copyright. By the way, the Canadian doesn't have to have any part of the copyright. It could even be 100% owned by the U.S. entity. So just figure that U.S. broadcasters, okay, who may want to have that ability to have their show also be recognized as Canadian, you, you could have a show that is basically sold to a U.S. broadcaster, okay, and yet some uh, be licensed to a Canadian broadcaster, be a U.S. production and a Canadian production. Right. So, and now that we've compared the goodies that you get for a co-venture versus the goodies that you get for a treaty copro. Why don't we just sort of blitz through some of the requirements that you need mm -hmm. to hit to have a successful co-venture? Mm -hmm. Do you want to take us through? On the co-venture side? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, um, so like I said, the co-venture is really non-treaty. In other words, you're probably going to always favor a treaty co-production before you go co-venture. And so that in reality, you're looking at this as for non-treaty countries. But even if you are with a treaty country, you're still allowed to go with non-treaty. Okay, so you could have a UK co-venture if because of the fact that maybe you don't meet the treaty requirements. One of the things with the treaty requirements is that your actors, okay, have to also be national nationals from the two countries. So if all of a sudden, your main stars are, can, are American and you don't meet those co-production treaty requirements. Another one would be the non-treaty country. Uh, go, go the co-venture route. Just because of the fact that you didn't make it in a treaty means, hey, you could still make it as a, 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 a co-venture. Both of the producers have to be um, you know, sharing themselves the control of the production. And... The other interesting point is, remember, we talked about the point system. The points here, are, instead of being 6 out of 10, they're 5 out of 10. But you still have to have those uh, key personnel that we were talking about, okay? But at least you don't have that sixth point. So there's a, uh, there's a flexibility. There's, there's a lowering of some of the thresholds. They still have to meet the, the requirements of what, you know, all of these elements of getting certification through the, uh, the, the CRTC, but they're just a little lower the, the biggest element was producer didn't have to be exclusively Canadian. Copyright doesn't have to be exclusively Canadian. Lower percentage of points, lower number of points to be, to be hit. And um, you don't have to have a treaty. Given those components, the co-venture has a nice little niche area that, in, that, that would give you that benefit of having your film or TV production recognized as a, a Canadian uh, adv advantage. The other thing is that you'll end up getting services credit. Anyway, you're still getting a tax credit. It isn't that the co-venture doesn't get any tax credits. You will have a service production, and those service productions is based on what you spend in Canada. Now, the interesting part with service productions, when you look at it, we had talked about the fact that there are federal, product, uh, federal service credits and provincial service credits. In some cases, Quebec and Ontario, that credit is based on what is called all spend, whereas content is based on labor. So you may actually get very similar to a content tax credit, a service production, if you spend a lot of money in the province. So it's not necessarily that bad 
to go from a content to a service production. It's basically telling you your, your money, you, you're still getting some, some financing from these, these um, uh, film incentives. You just have to basically calculate them and make up the rest by other ways of financing your film. Great. So do we want to maybe run through tax credits yeah. and some other places to shoot, right? Because we've focused a lot on Canada in this episode and in every other episode. But I think it's important to realize that there's a great big world out there. Yes, right? absolutely. And, uh, and, 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 and Canada actually created it. Or let's say we may be one of the founders of these film tax credits. Okay. Uh, we started off, like we mentioned, with different shelters and different types of structures where there were incentives for, uh, for people to invest in film. Uh, it ended up being tax credits that we came up with. Uh, the world started noticing Canada. There was something called rever uh, there was something called runaway productions. So, as a measure against these runaway productions, which people were saying, "Hey, what's happening in Canada? The people are going to Canada. They're running away. Why don't we?" All of these different jurisdictions decided themselves to bring in tax credits for that for their own jurisdiction, realizing how successful Canada had been. Right. So, do do we want to maybe run through yeah. a couple or? I know yes. we we could we could in fact at the at the moment now when we are talking if there is practically if you look at it essentially almost not every United States state but there's probably over 30 US states okay that have tax credits themselves okay there are international these are the, the Canadian tax credits themselves, okay, the, which are almost every single province has a tax credit themselves, and various international countries themselves, all the way from Australia to the United Kingdom, and even Spain and the Canary Islands themselves have tax credits. Uh, if you look, there's even different sites that actually can go into here, United States, giving you anything from Alabama to Wyoming, okay? Um, in international, you're looking at everything from in Africa, in Asia, in the Caribbean, in Central America, in Europe themselves. It is amazing how many countries have tax credits. And these tax credits themselves, when you look at it, is essentially, we tried to break them down. This was something that I did a little bit of a calculation. For instance, we broke them down to labor tax credits, production tax credits, and did a percentage on them. Um, so essentially, each one tries to follow the same formula. In other words, you come over into our state, okay, in the United States, or you come to our country, and we will pay you a percentage of what you spend in that country. And so therefore, we're no longer distinctive. And so when a producer these days is saying, hey, I want to do a film, the first question would be, hey, where can I shoot the film? Technically, I can choose anywhere in the world to do the film. And in fact, when you see what's happening with filmmaking these days, you will notice that these films are being done all over the world. Um, Here's one, in a, they call it in best in Eastern Europe. Filming in Estonia, they say, is the best one in Europe. Why? Because it has a 30% cash rebate for film productions. Hungary. Many films are being done in Hungary. Uh, Blade Runner 2049, done by Denis Villeneuve, American production, but set uh they did the whole production shooting in hungary hungary has entire like i've googled this out of curiosity because i've touched a couple productions as well that have shot mm -hmm. in hungary they have entire lots i think outside of budapest mm -hmm. there's there's a lot that just is featured for westerns yeah right the other interesting thing about hungary though is there is also favor there's we could talk a little bit it's a it's a digression mm -hmm. definitely mm -hmm. but about the no withholding taxes between mm -hmm. Hungary and other countries, yeah. right? Yeah. No, the taxation is a big, a big situation. 
when you're doing your film itself, if you create your production company in one jurisdiction, uh, you would want that that jurisdiction uh, be only a, the service component producer itself. You The distribution rights are usually kept outside another country. But given sometimes that you've got treaties or, or tax treaties now we're talking about and withholding tax, it may be advantageous to actually structure some form of intermediary entity where the film is being licensed through a Hungary type. Exactly. So you have all these licensing intermediaries in Hungary, which are effectively positioned to do the following. Mm -hmm. Rather than me as a producer having a Japanese MG for Japanese distribution rights get paid directly to me in Canada, mm -hmm. it'll get paid from Japan to Hungary as an intermediary, mm -hmm. and then from Hungary to Canada, to Canada mm -hmm. and you've saved money on withholdings tax. Yeah. And it's a brilliant structure. Yes, yeah. And as those entities, given that those entities are actual entities that do in involve themselves in the licensing, it's not just a dummy type situation. There is an actual legal structure that's put in place uh, with even collection type societies and collection agencies that are based in these jurisdictions, the actual money flows and the actual collection efforts are done through that. So you have a really legitimate structure. Certainly. Yeah. So why don't we roll through some of these yeah. other okay, cool so places? Okay, so that was Hungary. That, that was, this is White God in Hungary that was being filmed there. Lithuania itself, uh, Venus in Lithuania, this has a 20% incentive. Macedonia, which itself is showing a 20% cash rebate. Czech Republic, Czech Republic, amazing locations. Uh, it probably one of the most preserved countries uh, is stepping back into time. Has a 20% rebate on qualifying Czech uh, spending. Croatia, Croatia got very famous uh, because of the fact that Game of Thrones, King's Landing is filmed in Dubrovnik. And here's a one shot from there. What were they offering? 20% rebate. That was sufficient. So... If you think about it, what were they doing? They were basically choosing where to set it properly. You're looking all over the world on um, true location setting, but then you're adding to that component a 20% rebate. So th that aspect of it is what probably, you know, made the final decision. Serbia, um, which has a 20% rebate. Poland, okay, Schindler's List was shot in Poland, okay? There, you basically have, you can get grants. Now, that's a different than a tax credit, okay? Grants, you basically have to sort of stand in line uh, for it, but that's another type of uh, incentive. In Western Europe, we have Ireland is probably one of the biggest uh, one. Ireland, the interesting part with Ireland is that not only do you get um, this tax credit, but you have the financing that comes through a, um, a special structure which is a tax structure that's been set up to actually finance these types of tax expenditures. You also just have great productions being shot yeah. there, like yeah. uh, Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. There's this a new film. Yeah, there was a co-production between Canada and and uh, the U and Ireland itself. Yeah, there's also a new-ish show called mm -hmm. Dairy Girls that I've been meaning to catch okay. for a while yeah. on Netflix. A lot of good production mm -hmm. going on up there. UK and Scotland, remember I said to you that when we, we've seen a lot of activity from the UK and Canada. And the reason the UK is, is very uh, popular, uh, right now it actually offers a 25% cash rebate, which is a little less than some of the other ones at 30. Uh, it's more than the 20%. But the reason the UK was popular was historically the UK had a structure called the UK sale leaseback, where you didn't even have to have a co-production with the UK you essentially sold the film through a UK structure and then leased it back and you were able to, to trigger a percentage of your budget that was coming from a UK structure. Um, Belgium itself has a, uh, a tax shelter itself, which allows, uh, it, here it mentions up to 45% of the Belgian eligible expenses. So this again is a combining not a, a tax credit itself, it's combining the ability to invest inside a film and you'll get back certain uh, parts of that uh, investment. France, uh, lots of films between Quebec and France, uh, given the language common, uh, language of French that could be done in both. 
Uh, here you have Madame Bovary shot in France. Uh, they essentially have two different credits. Here they're mentioning the 30% tax credits on uh, qualifying expenditures in France. Malta, small little country in the Mediterranean. But look at that, look at that location. I mean, that's, you know, you, you, you're looking, stepping back in time and, you know, and you'll, you'll get a 25% cash rebate. Italy itself, under the Tuscan sun was filmed in Italy. Uh, they have a 25% tax relief on qualifying expenditures. Austria, good night, mommy. Multiple funding options there, cash rebate of 20%. Germany, Germany, uh, here you have Barbara filmed in Germany. It's called the German... Uh, film fund, the FFF, essentially 20%. Um, historically, Germany had what was called the media funds. And the media funds were similar to this UK sell leaseback, where investors could go into the media fund, get a tax write-off. The media fund was managing money and investing it in different films. And it didn't have to be a German film. These days, you have to be a German film. When you had these types of funds... Those funds were not limited to investing in, 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 in German films. They were investing in American films and Canadian films, and people in Germany were getting those tax deductions. Scandinavia, Iceland. Northern Lights in Iceland, 25% cash rebate. Norway, amazing types of locations, 25%. In Asia, we have Singapore. Those crazy rich Asians, I guess. But fantastic locations. Uh, Again, here, they're mentioning 50% of your qualifying expenses that comes. Malaysia, very unique locations there, 30% cash rebate. Oceania, Fiji. So Fiji is an interesting yes, one, no? Fiji here, you had the Blue Lagoon shot in 1980. I actually was involved in a Fiji film, okay? Now it says 47% tax rebate, okay? However, the problem with the Fiji film that I was involved in was during the filming and almost the, like the last day of shooting, there was a coup. A political coup had occurred in Fiji. So our client had, was literally stuck. They, they had their film, the last couple of days of shooting of their film was stuck in Fiji. And the, the money that was supposed to be coming from Fiji didn't completely end up coming. But we were lucky enough to actually get all of the film materials out of Fiji before... It was shut down. So one of the elements when you go to these types of countries, right, to Malaysia's and other countries, is you don't really know the political stability. So you are taking an additional risk. And some of the things that happens when you're going there is your completion bond. Remember, many times we're looking at ensuring the production, the completion of the film. If you're going to jurisdictions that have political risk, you may not be able to get that type of insurance. The other thing is what I would imagine, and this is probably one notch below the bonder concern, it's that whenever you have a force majeure clause mm -hmm. in any contract that yeah. is set to shoot in a country in which there is some instability, mm -hmm. they're going to be very, very careful to define whether revolution, coup yeah. d'etat, et cetera, whether that constitutes a force majeure yes. or not. Yeah. That's going to be an actual pressure point. Australia. Now we're getting into, uh, this was called Charlotte's Web that was filmed there by uh, Paramount Pictures. Australia says that there's a 40% production offset. Um, and I think it's more like 30% uh, on what you get actually out of Australia. But again, each one of these requires you to go more into more detail. Uh, New Zealand has a film commission where they're giving you a 20% cash rebate. We recently met somebody in New Zealand in Los Angeles, and there's one show that we were working on that decided to use New Zealand and Canada. It did a combination between Canada and New Zealand as a co-production itself. Best in North America, number one, Canada, obviously. Look at what they've, they've looked at Canada as being full of ice and snow. And that's the revenant. Yeah. There. And they basically state that the film commissions are in each of these provinces. They range from 32% to 70% of eligible labor. The reason we get to that 70% or more like 65% to 70% is because some of the provinces actually have bonus additions to it and so forth. Uh, Latin America, Colombia, 
the number one place. Colombia, this is Embrace of the Serpent. Colombia has 40% for film services and 20% for film logistical services. Trinidad and Tobago, if you're looking for Caribbean type, uh, you can get a cash rebate of 55%. Puerto Rico, which is a territory of the United States, has one of the best tax credits around. 40% production tax credit. And we have a, a client of mine who will finance uh, your shoot in Puerto Rico. So the question sometimes is you're running to these places, but who do you know often determines how you end up being there because of the fact that they have to put in place the, the, um, the structure to be able to access this tax credit. Dominican Republic, 25%. Panama, uh, apart from the Panama Papers, only has 15% cash rebate. Best in the Middle East, United Arab Emirates, the UAE with 30%. Best in Africa, South Africa. We have a treaty with South Africa. So you could do a UK, South Africa type of co-production with Canada, and that has a 20% tax credit. So as you can see, these tax credits are literally worldwide. You know, you choose the country and essentially try and combine them either where wherever you're from, or just go there and then basically uh, make sure that you have people on the ground, the company that you're going to engage has to be somebody who you trust. Any type of co-production agreement that you're going to enter into has to be also based on that trust. But as we mentioned, there's a lot of things that need to go into that co-production. And then accessing that money, because even though we're able to have all these percentages that are there, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what you're going to end up at the end. And we're going to deal with this a little bit later on on another episode where these are all nice numbers, but what do you actually get out of these numbers? Yeah. And that's when you have to finance those, those, these credits themselves. So I think we're just about ready to wrap this yeah. episode, but yeah. just to leave off on one note, all things being equal on that list, not for film, which do you want to visit the most? Oh, I don't know. Some of those, those tropical islands seemed a lot, very attractive on my end. So uh, I would say to you that uh, we're not, I'm not close to any one of those. Well, I'm pretty sure the, the, the shot that you're in right now is featuring a drab Montreal day. Yeah, so that yeah. makes uh, complete sense. Yeah. So we've talked about tax credits, which is known as soft money. Mm -hmm. In next episode, we're going to talk about risk investors, mm -hmm. which is also known as hard money. Yeah. So if everyone could stay tuned, that's yeah. what we're going to talk about next. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you.